Welcome back to the Engineered Angler. I'm out here at the lathe uh, working on this oversized crankbait, uh, the lip crankbait I plan to use as a trolling bait uh, out in the Gulf of Mexico in the summertime when it's calm out and I can get out in the deeper water. I like to pull something behind me while I eat lunch. <laughs> but anyway, I wanted to use this as a platform to talk about uh, hinges between segmented lures. I'm going to segment this lure right there where you see that line but we need to talk a little bit about what makes a good joint and uh, what makes a weak one. So stick around. Okay, so before we start talking about the specifics of that particular lure and the kind of uh, hinge or pivot point that I'm going to put on it, Let's talk about some of the ones that we've already seen, right? Some of the ones that you're seeing on um, production model swim baits and uh, crank baits, and some of the ones that are being used by our fellow uh, uh, lure makers. So here are some of the typical ones, right? The simplest one might be if this is the tail and here's your head. Uh, simplest one might be a single uh, screw eye with an opposing screw eye in the opposite direction, or two of the same, right? Uh, screw it on here. That's a really common way to make uh, a hinge. It's real simple. It's pretty robust depending on the wood uh, and how well you glue it in. If you're using balsa, not so much. Another very common way of creating a hinge in your lure is to do a V hinge. So if this is your lure body with a deep V cut into it, uh, and perhaps, you know, the eye is here somewhere, um, and you've got a V there, and then you've got, on, on the tail end, you've got a V cut that is uh, meant to go into that V, of course. On some relatively lure-like shape, <laughs> this isn't exactly the nicest lure in the world, but so essentially a V inside a V, right? You've got the male and the female, and typically what you see with this kind of arrangement is a, uh, a single or a double hinge, meaning uh, you'll have either one screw eye or two screw eyes that fit into, if, if this is the inner wall in there, you'll have a slot cut out in here. And of course that should be dashed. Um, and these fit in and then you'll have a pin that drives through. Benefits of doing this are, are two things. One is that you hide all the hardware, that it looks good. The other thing is that it's relatively robust. This pin has a lot of uh, material around it and allows for it not to burst when it's getting tugged. It's, so it's pretty tough as long as you take into consideration how deeply you embed this pin. But relatively speaking, this is a pretty tough hinge. The bad part of that this hinge is it gives you very little range of motion. Imagine that this is your lure and you've cut a hinge into it and now you've got this gap between the back and the front. The ability to move is limited by that little gap there. So it's going to be able to move a couple of degrees to either side. That's not very good. You don't get a whole lot uh, bang for your buck. That's a tough joint to cut because you've got to cut nice. These that are uh, symmetric to each other, otherwise you have some issues. Uh, but not only is it a little difficult to make, it uh, leaves you with very little motion as you swim this bait. I feel that this particular one, even though it's one of the most popular ones you see out there, is probably the least beneficial. This one is similar to the V, except for it's rounded. And this gives you the option of having a, a wider range of motion. So typically you'll see a slot cut out or two slots cut out. And that slot will allow for a single screw eye that will be embedded in this end. And if you can imagine, it would be on its side there. And then a pin would be driven through here uh, that would pierce the eye on that screw eye. Uh, typically, I use a single point. Let me show you mine. Typically, I use uh, that single point, and you can see uh, 
it's pretty simple to make. But the beauty of it is that you have this huge range of motion that's, an, that's over 90 degrees and it's only three joints. So that's pretty good. Here's one with only two joints and you can see you get a pretty good almost 45, not quite. It's about a 35 degree angle there. Uh, but it's a simple little joint and it's pretty robust. It doesn't completely hide the hardware. So aesthetically it's not the greatest. And the other is that it does create a very fine, let me show you here, it creates a very fine point where there's not that much uh, structural material between the, uh, the, the world and that pin. So there could be a bursting failure here. So let's talk a little bit about what, what constitutes strength. What's going to really give you strength? First thing you got to take into consideration is what is the likely failure mode? How's this thing going to fail if it fails? So typically, the screw and I is not going to fail. It's usually pretty robust, pretty tough, and isn't going to come out or straight. And the pin that uh, pierces it uh, is usually tough enough. I use stainless steel. It's relatively small in diameter, but it's strong enough since it's in shear. Because it has such a small gap here getting pulled on, it's not likely to bend or break. So the failure mode that you're really going to expect to happen is for, if I'm looking down at the hinge, the failure mode is most likely to be in this material here. So if this hinge pin is excessively thin, it'll tend to shear through here, almost cut it like a knife. If it's thick enough, if it's appropriately thick enough, it'll cause a failure that's a bursting failure that'll be on almost a 45 degree off that pin because it, that circular shape will distribute the load. So this is really boring, right? Nah. Okay, so th since we're relying on the strength per square inch, right? The more of this material we load, the better. So the bigger this pin is, the better to a limit. If it's too big, then you end up with a, a wall that's way too thin and you don't get the strength. So there is a sweet spot, right? How big this is, how much wall you end up with, because if you break in two areas, that's double or nearly double the area if it breaks down the middle. So you're going to ask me, what is, what's the sweet spot? Well, here's where I'm going to tell you. So if you use a pin radius that's approximately 20% uh, times the uh, lure radius at that joint, you're pretty safe. That's a pretty good estimation for getting close to that sweet spot. So 20% is a good rule of thumb. That's what I like to use. Now, on that lure, we're not going to do any of those. We're going to do a double hinge. And let me show you what that looks like. A double hinge is going to be made up of a, a single hinge plate that stretches from one edge to the, of the bottom to the other, and then two pins that run through it. And so if, if you look at this hinge plate, it'll look something like a figure eight, just a sort of a mild figure eight, just to reduce the weight. You can make it rectangular if you wanted to, it wouldn't matter too much. The body itself will come to circular ends. And this is looking down. And so you can imagine that the pin would be driven there and there. The beauty of this system is two. One, you get a very strong system if it's done correctly. And two, you get a very, very flexible system because it actually has a double fold. So this can actually rotate all the way around 180 degrees, which means that the lure is very flexible. It allows for a couple of things. It allows for the lure to flex as the fish is fighting on it, which gives you a little better control in keeping him hooked so he doesn't shake a heavy lure like this off as easy as he would. And it allows you to hide the hardware pretty well because realistically, I can have this body, these two body sections right up next to each other. And I can have a very small clearance between those two sections. The beauty here is 
that as long as you keep this distance from the center of the pin to the face of this round part longer than any of these distances, this thing will rotate freely without ever catching. It, it allows you to embed this hinge plate deep so that you have that plenty of meat uh, to support that pin. And it allows you to have all that flexibility. It's a little more difficult to make, but it's worthwhile on big lures. On the next video, I'll be building that lure all the way out. And I'll build all the parts to this hinge and you'll get to see it in action. Thank you for watching. Send any questions to me. Let me know what you're thinking and if you have any other suggestions. I'll catch you in the next one.